Previously, I said that in my personal opinion, Behringer are crap, and as a result, a swarm of furious Behringer fanboys descended upon my comment section like wasps, calling me an idiot, claiming that the current range of interfaces from Behringer sound amazing. Maybe I'd been unfair by saying that they're crap, especially since I'd not actually tested their latest interfaces, and I was just going off my previous experiences of having owned many other Behringer products. So I immediately went to Toman and ordered their only interface currently offering eight mic pre's, the UMC1820. And it just arrived, so we're going to put it through some inarguable objective tests in this video and see how it compares to the Focusrite Claret. If the Behringer unit performs the same or better, you'll see that in these tests. I have no dog in this fight, and if it's good, it's good, and I'll take back what I said before. I'm not an advocate of buying expensive premium brands just because of the marketing hype. If you watch any of my videos, you'll know that. I'm interested in what works, what gets professional results, what sounds good, but I'm not at all interested in good for the price or value for money. I'm interested in good, full stop. Price just isn't a relevant variable in that equation, unless it's just genuinely prohibitively expensive like a pair of the flagship PMCs, and then we can build our own for 1 50th of the price. So we're gonna look at the construction, the features, and then test the audio quality of this Behringer unit. So there's plastic knobs and plastic buttons, and the whole thing kind of like creaks. As you can see, it's got plastic knobs and plastic buttons and an external inline power supply, whereas the Focusrite unit has all metal knobs and it's got a proper IEC power connection and an internal power supply. Although the Focusrite Claret is a full-blown USB interface, you can also use it as a standalone converter. You do this by routing the mic pre's to ADAT and then the ADAT inputs to the analog outputs and then you've got a full standalone converter. But with the Behringer unit, you don't have any routing software, so you can't route between the analog and digital, and so that doesn't work at all unless you wanna set some stuff up in your DAW and record arm the tracks and do all that sort of stuff, which no one's gonna to bother to do, so you basically just can't use it for that purpose either. In terms of headphone monitoring, with the Focusrite unit, I can set up a bunch of custom headphone mixes the way that I want in the software mixer. It's got two headphone outputs, but if I've got a additional headphone amplifier handy, then I can have even more headphone mixes. But with the Behringer unit, I'm a lot more limited because I don't have any of that software mixer stuff. I've just got the possibility to morph between the live microphone inputs and what's coming back from the DAW, and I can choose channels one and two or three and four, and that's pretty much it. So for the first sound quality test, I wanted to inspect how much noise there was on the line level inputs. I used a 440 test tone to calibrate all of the eight input knobs on both units to precisely minus 0.5 dB. And with the reference level that I was using on the Focusrite unit, you can just turn all of the knobs all the way up and all of the levels are precisely minus 0.5 dB with an absolutely tiny margin of error. The tolerances here are very impressive indeed. With the Behringer unit, there's a tiny bit more gain in the preamps, but the cheap feeling plastic knobs are extremely hard to precisely set, because after you let go of the knobs, they like to settle back to a slightly different level than you wanted, so it's really fiddly to precisely set the level. So after I'd calibrated all of the game pots to the same reference level, I checked the noise level with nothing playing, but just with a cable connected to the input. And I was initially very pleasantly surprised by the Behringer unit, as it seemed to be somewhat quieter than the Focusrite Claret. Compared to my previous experiences with Behringer, this seems to be in a completely different universe. So it might seem true that Behringer have improved significantly in recent years. However, most people will be using these interfaces for recording microphones and not just line level signals. So I'm much more interested in how the mic pre's sound. So let's check that now with this SM7B, which I'm talking into now, and I'm recording with the Focusrite interface. This is probably the most famous low sensitivity mic, which bad preamps struggle with. So what we can do is just record the SM7B on max gain on both units, and then use additional digital gain to match them
So for my crosstalk test, I'm going to record all eight channels of both interfaces and then I'm going to boost up the channels that we didn't directly record into. And then to pass the test, you need to not hear the ukulele on any of the other inputs. So I'm recording this voiceover with an SM7B going into the Behringer interface and this is my experimentation session that I started yesterday. So this is when I got the interface. It had actually been sitting there on for a couple of hours as I was plugging stuff in and playing around with it. But then I just did a preliminary draft crosstalk test to test out how it was sounding. And this is, I hadn't even tuned the ukulele yet and this is what it sounded like. the first four inputs seemed to be somehow coupled and there was a huge amount of crosstalk there. And then for reference, this is what the Focusrite interface sounded like. Just again, this was just the preliminary draft that I did. Yeah, you can hear that there's essentially zero crosstalk. I can't hear any crosstalk at all on the Focusrite interface, but there's a massive amount of crosstalk happening here on the first four channels, or the, the first three after the first mic input. So I was like, okay, that is a huge amount, but this morning I woke up and I thought, well, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I was saying something stupid because it can't really be that bad. And the noise that I did in the previous ukulele recording that you just saw, it was really excessive. I was like, it can't be that bad. So then I recorded another test this morning. So as you can hear, the noise is almost gone. Everything sounds way better. Let's check the crosstalk. There's no more crosstalk magically and the noise of the first channel has gotten way better. So what happened? There's this button here called line inst and on decent quality gear, this is normally irrelevant to the mic preamp because decent gear will normally isolate the quarter inch jack input when a microphone is plugged into it for this exact reason. And so I decided to test it on the Focusrite Claret as well. So now I'm speaking through the SM7B again into the Focusrite Claret on maximum gain. And it's also got the same feature where you can switch line and inst. And I always just thought that this is irrelevant to the mic pre, but we can hear that's on line and I'll switch to inst. So the focus right claret doesn't seem to isolate that part of the circuitry either. So that's the first real thing that I've been surprised about in terms of a letdown in quality from the focus right unit. I would expect it to isolate that. That said, the feature is only available to the first two channels and there's a massive red light that comes on when it's enabled and the noise is way lower. Whereas on the Behringer interface, you can't see whether it's in or out because the button has no light or anything and it's on all of the channels. Now I'm going to switch back to the Behringer unit and activate that button. It drops the signal and dramatically increases the noise and crosstalk. So let's play the ukulele one last time and see the crosstalk now. We can normalize the direct signal and then for the rest of them, we can boost them up 60 dB like we did with the other ones and we can check the crosstalk. So let's firstly listen to how noisy it is without the button depressed and with the button depressed. Okay, so a big difference there. Let's have a look at the crosstalk. If I'm not mistaken, I can actually hear some ukulele coming through in this one, but it's very faint and that wouldn't be a problem at all under normal conditions. Let's have a listen here. There we go, the first four channels are coupled and I tested it out and the second four channels are also coupled. And I think channel five is probably the worst for some reason on this particular unit. So that explains the higher crosstalk and noise that I was getting 
on those initial tests. I must have just put that button in by accident and it's not like it's very obvious either. There's no light or anything to tell you and you can't really see it one way or another whether, whether it's pressed in or not. It's not very obvious whatsoever. But let's just give them the benefit of the doubt and to say that everyone knows about this button. Don't push in that button because if you're recording a microphone and it will sound terrible but that actually doesn't explain everything and there's still a mystery because in this initial test there's less noise but way more crosstalk let's have a listen again to the crosstalk and the noise <laughs> That's a massive amount of crosstalk. Let's now talk about headphone amps. So one of the main factors that can affect the sound quality of a headphone amplifier, apart from having enough loudness and low distortion, is output impedance. Output impedance is very important, and the lower the output impedance, the better, especially when you're using dynamic headphones. So this is because a headphone amplifier and a pair of headphones form a voltage divider. And if the headphones output impedance is higher relative to the headphones impedance, then you get a less accurate frequency response. A higher output impedance also results in lower electrical damping, which makes the bass sound loose. But instead of relying on marketing materials, which rarely mention output impedance anyway, you can just test this yourself if you've got an oscilloscope and a 10 ohm resistor. So the peak to peak voltage without the resistor is 600 millivolts and then the peak to peak voltage with the resistor it drops down to 200 millivolts and then with that information we can work out the impedance. So if my oscilloscope and math are both correct then the Behringer unit has an output impedance of 21 and a half ohms which is quite high and not very good and the Focusrite has an output impedance of 5.6 ohms which is also not amazing but it's much much better. For my next test I wanted to check out the frequency response and distortion levels so I did a line level loopback as close to 0 dB full scale as possible without clipping. So we see that both interfaces have almost the exact same frequency response at 44.1 kHz but the Behringer unit has more than twice the amount of distortion on average across all frequencies compared to the Claret. Whereas the Claret has proportionally more second harmonic, but that should be taken in the right context though as both interfaces exhibit distortion levels easily low enough to be called transparent, but this would be more of a concern with multiple round trips. But for a little bit of fun here at the end of the video, let's do another test, a loopback test, and sometimes you might see loopbacks one, two, five, ten times, but let's do it 300 times and see what happens. So as you could undoubtedly hear, after 100 loopbacks, the Behringer unit had completely destroyed the sound, and there wasn't really much point continuing after that amount of loopbacks. Yet after 300 passes through the Focusrite unit, the sound held up ridiculously well. In fact, the main difference was that it sounded a bit compressed for some reason, but it almost sounded good. 
If you just want to simply record eight mics into your computer without any elaborate monitoring, without installing drivers, and if you're extremely careful with the button positions and you have good luck and the thing doesn't develop a fault or catch fire and you don't have digital speakers and you don't mind that it has a low quality plastic feel that creaks when you touch it and you don't care that the headphone amplifier has a higher output impedance and you don't care that it doesn't have an IEC power socket and you don't care that it has fiddly knobs that are hard to set precise gain levels and you don't care that there's bleed in the monitoring knob between the mics and DAW and you don't experience any mystery clicks or deteriorated sound quality like I did in the first few hours of owning it then and only then is this not just cheap rubbish but personally I do care about many of those things. So after all, after having tested this brand new Behringer unit, I think I'm entitled to my personal opinion that Behringer are crap. 